Thank you, Gento. 31 years without justice, but no one day without memory and pain. This morning, my daughter asked me, what do I remember from that terrible day, 31 years ago? After spending six, six years in Jerusalem studying in rabbinical school, I, book, I moved back home to Argentina with the dream of doing what a rabbi should do, bring Jews closer to Judaism and people of different religious backgrounds closer to each other. However, the attack changed all of my priorities. I, like many of my colleagues, became a voice demanding justice, the same justice that is still missing. What do I remember? I remember everything. I woke up in the morning, I showered, and went to Arroyo 910 to the embassy. I was invited to attend a briefing regarding the peace conversations in Oslo with the Palestinian Authority. Around 1 p.m., a friend who was at the meeting told me, you know, I checked and the lunch that they're serving looks lousy. Let's sit somewhere else. So I followed his advice and I left the building. But before leaving, I said goodbye to Marcela Droblas, a very close high school friend whose job was to assist Rafael Eldad, the embassy's cultural attaché. And then I went to see Mirta Science, the ambassador's secretary, and also my brother-in-law sister. We agreed to see each other the following Saturday to celebrate our niece's birthday. I'm sure it's clear that I never saw either of them again. I remember everything, the crying and the despair. I remember the spot I was in when I was waiting to see if anyone was still alive. And then, as the days went by, I remember waiting to see if another body was found so that another Jewish funeral could be performed. I remember having discussions with the Orthodox rabbinate who, after a week, wanted to create a kever achim, a mass grave. I remember fighting to give Jewish burial even to pieces of Jewish bodies because I thought it would be the right thing to do. I remember waiting and waiting and waiting with the hope that Eliora Carmon, whose voice buried by debris could be heard in the silence of the night, would be found alive. She was the consul's wife and had five kids then in Colegio Tarbut. As a rabbi, I participated in seven funerals of the people we remember today. Diplomats' bodies were shipped to Israel. And I still recall coming back to the place when the attack happened, standing next to the Chabad rabbi, surrounded by debris, trying to see if we could identify bodies before they were taken. In doing so, we might notify the families earlier, so to avoid hours of agony that it will take until they receive the official notification. I remember March the 20th, it was a Friday, around noon, three days after the attack, a man, an acquaintance of mine, lost his wife. And he called me that they called him from the morgue. They have a couple of bodies that needed to be identified. And they thought one may be his wife. He asked me if I will go with him and I said, of course. We arrive, he walks from body to body, and finally, after spending a while in front of one of them, he says, I think this is she. We call the supervisor, and we say to him, we think this is his wife. The guy looked at us, remember, he's the expert, and said, I'm sorry, sir, 
It's not your wife. This is the body of a man. I'm not telling you this just for a morbid example. I want you and me to remember the dimension of the catastrophe. Like many here, I dedicate many Mondays of my life to be at the square in front of the Supreme Court house, asking for justice, but none was ever provided. I had many meetings with community leaders, with honorable people, and also with so many liars. I had many meetings with politicians, most of them liars, and those who did try to help but didn't have enough power to do so. To be far away causes me to take the passing of time very seriously. That terrorist attack, together with the bombing of the AMIA, as many of you have heard me say on various occasions, shaped the life of hundreds of thousands of Jews and inspired many to leave the country and even come here. Now, 31 years later, we are still challenged to keep the memory alive. And when we remember at that moment, the bomb explodes again. It explodes again when we realize the deep impunity that surrounded and still surrounds the case. It explodes again any time that a mother tries to explain to the kids when asked who killed their father, who killed their mother, and they have no answer. It explodes again whenever you can find the same names of the people that never investigate in high position in Argentinian politics, in the police, in the parliament, still today. You know, in the fourth book of the Torah, known as Bamidbar Numbers, there is a very interesting paragraph where the Israelite receives instruction regarding the treatment of an involuntary killing. This is what it says. When a person is killed without intention, what do we do with him? He's still killed. So the answer is that they need to be sent to one of six cities called Arei Miklat, the cities of refuge. But only when the high priest dies can they be released. Buenos Aires, my city, is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's one full of art and wisdom from writers and poets and tango and the best food. It became a city of refuge for murderers. And again on July 18, 1994, that role was confirmed on January 18, 2015, when the prosecutor and chief investigator of the AMIA, Alberto Nisman, was killed. Now you know, there is no high priest who can free the city today. Only justice can be that beacon in the night. And now a confession. Every time we gather to commemorate the tragedy of September 11, the bombing of the Twin Towers, 3,000 plus people killed, I think the following. The bombing of the AMIA was possible because nobody took seriously the investigation of the bombing in the Israeli embassy. The attack of the Twin Towers was possible because nobody took seriously the bombing of the Argentinian Twin Towers. It happened in South America. This cannot happen here in America. We thought naively. Your presence tonight sends a loud message to the family members of the innocent victims. You are not alone. And to the terrorist organization behind the attack, listen carefully. It may take us longer, but we will find you. May the souls of the 29 victims whose memories live on be an inspiration to continue to fight for justice. Let me conclude by telling you not what I remember, but what I want to remind you. If we don't work to make sure that Iran, the group responsible for the attack, doesn't grow its nuclear arsenal, and Hezbollah, who executed the attack, doesn't lose strength, any embassy, any community is in danger. You know, for those who grew up in Argentina, they remember that every March 17 and every July 18, the way we honor the victim is we say their names, and the people answer presente, which means they are alive.
Please rise as we name one by one and we answer present. Celia Aide Segui. Present. Carlos Raúl Siles. David Yoel Ben Rafael. Present. Eli Ben Zeev. Beatriz Mónica Berenstein. Juan Carlos Brumana. Rubén Cayetano Cachiato. Eliora Carmón. Marcela Droblas. Andrés Elouson, Miguel Ángel Lomasi, Aníbal Leguizamón, Escorina de Albarracín, Alfredo Castro, Freddy Machado Castro, Francisco Mandaroni, Mausi Myers de Hernández, Alexis Alejandro Cuarín, Mirta Sáenz, Raquel Sherman de Intraup, Liliana Graciela Susevich de Levinson, Enzeaba Zeave. Yes, I only mentioned 22 because there were other seven victims that nobody never came to look for them. They were immigrants without papers, so the family were afraid to come and recall the bodies. They were working them. But we know that there are hard workers that came from foreign countries around Argentina. And as you may also be surprised, some of you, most of them are not Jewish. Most of them are not Israeli. They were kids and teachers in the Catholic school across the street. There were people in the building around. Terror never discriminates. They kill. And we, and we bet on life. Shabbat shalom. Please rise for a, remain standing for a leino as we invite 